as a martial arts school, a lot of people come through and teach for us at, at, through high school and college. They're helping out and teaching, and then they they would go off and uh, and and either go to college or they'd go you know join the law enforcement military or whatever. And for the longest time, you know, my dad always talks about this, but it was always hard for us. We're like, man, we invest all these in these people, and, uh, but then that book kind of changed it, where it's just this this mindset of you're taking an arrow and you're shooting it out into rather it's law enforcement or you're shooting it out into military or the workforce or college or wherever you're shooting them, shooting them into an area and they're gonna make an impact there. You've done all that work where they're gonna go make an impact. Hello, welcome to the Martial Arts Lifestyle. This is James Cox and we are in episode number 62 today. I have a special guest with me. This is Mr. Cody Garza. You have to uh, look back, I forget the number, but we, had a Grandmaster Al Garza on as a special guest. He was in person here in Abilene doing a training seminar with us. And man, what a pow powerful speaker, the content that Mr. Garza added. And now we get to go to the son of Mr. Al Garza. You guys are in the Houston area, Dickinson, League City. Man, you guys have been a trademark in that community. Um, I've known y'all for a long time. We were just kids kind of competing together and involved in a lot of the same associations in, in the great state of Texas. Um, I still go there at least once a year with you guys and some of the trainings. And when you walk into a, a, a school with, with Al Garza and the Garza family, there's some special magic. And you guys are doing powerful things there. So I just want to commend you for that. And uh, yeah, and Cody, I know you're branching out and do a lot of and a lot of different things. So we got some good stuff to talk about. How about you just kind of tell us a little bit more about yourself and kind of your journey here as in martial arts? Uh, well, first of all, just man, mad props to you for 62 episodes of a podcast. That's something that I think a lot of martial arts school owners and people like you and, and 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 I and the people in our uh, realm would love to do, but it's the the persistence and the ability to go for 62 episodes and still rocking it. I'm super impressed. Yeah, and I mean, I watch you from a distance over here, you know, see some of your stuff you're putting on Facebook. I'm always super impressed with the high quality uh, martial arts and, and, and training that you're putting out on top of obviously this podcast. So props to you, but uh, yeah, I'll talk Thanks, about myself for a little bit. Um, yeah. Yeah, so my dad is is Al Garza. He's been in business here in uh, Dickinson, League City, and now Pearland for about 46 years, going on 47 years this year. Um, so uh, I was born into this. Obviously, I'm not that old, so I was born into this. Um, I'm 33 right now, almost 34. Been doing martial arts my whole life. You know, I, I went through starting off with karate and, and doing it kind of just because it was what my dad did. So I did it um, and, you know, I, I took breaks off and on playing football and doing basketball and other things off and on, but kind of always consistently came back to this is something that we did in our family. So I did it. it wasn't until I was about 14 that I, uh, I guess maybe about 13, I decided, okay, let's, I'm gonna really go for this. I got my black belt at 14. Um, and then from there, I decided that it was what I wanted to do with my life. So I, I started really focusing in on learning, learning the business. My dad is uh, very much, you know, not that he's against college by any means, but he was like, you know, you can go to college, but I can teach you. If you come shadow me, I can teach you the business here and things like that. And so I did, I did a little bit of college, but I focused a lot on learning, you know, how to run a successful martial arts school, how to teach. Um, obviously a lot of training through different organizations that we've been part of over the years um, that has helped with that as well. But yeah, so since since 14, I got my Blackwood at 14, joined staff right away, was the youngest kid in my group with a job. So I got to buy her buy meals and the movies all the time. Uh, but uh, but yeah, so then ever since then, I've been teaching. I, I, I was a program director for a long time. After, I guess I was about 20, I became a program director at Leaksey Locations. So I kind of moved off the mat and into the office more doing the the marketing and the sales and kind of that side of it after I taught for, for several years. Um, still teaching, but that was my main focus at that point. And then eventually, I guess about five, almost five years ago now, um, we wanted to branch out and try one of these uh, small school models that Premier Martial Arts at the time was talking a lot about. So, um, you know, we we have two big, large locations at the time. They were both 5,000 square foot. And we went, I went out in Paraland and opened up a 1,400 square foot location and um, opened that school under still my dad and, and that name and everything. I mean, it's not my own school. It's just another, it's a third location for our family. And um, and so, yeah, that one is our, our S1X or small school model. And uh, that one's rocking now. So we got the three locations and now I've moved back. I guess uh, it was right around COVID time when we shut down. I had replaced myself in Pearland and now I'm kind of uh, over all the locations, move around a little bit and help with training and um, and instructor training and, and staff development, marketing, stuff like that. 
That's awesome, man. So literally born into the martial arts. You know, there's a lot of school owners um, that have children, and that's 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 kind of really what they want to happen. They want to leave a legacy where they can pass something on, and you guys continue to pay it forward. And you know, you guys are great martial artists. Your schools are beautiful, and you're you're doing powerful things. And even um, you know, still at a young age, but you've had a lot of hours involved in the martial arts and, and uh, you guys evolving and doing what you do. It's in the legacy. And that's something that I'm passionate about too, is, is taking the torch. I feel super blessed, obviously, you know, like you said, my dad has a great name in the community down here. So for me to be able to take that torch that he's worked so hard to, to do and run with it, it feels like a huge blessing. And then for me, I have four boys now. And so I'm, I'm always looking at what can I do to grow this and make it something that, that I can hand down to, you know, right now, of course, they're young. So the, the three older ones, at least the baby's too young for it. But the three older ones argue over which one gets which location. And, you know, they want to they, they want to take it from me one day. But, um, you know, we'll see how that goes over the next 15, 20 years, whatever. But I mean, that's kind of the legacy is what I think what I always think of, you know, is leaving a legacy for, from my dad to me and then from me to my kids. I hope if they continue to, to want it like they do now. Yeah, you're painting the, the vision early on with these you know, your children and that they, they're growing into. So maybe the expectation is, well, yeah, of course, it's a family owned business that's passed down from grandpa to dad to me, you know, on and on. So that's, that's powerful. Uh, why would you say you really do this? There's lots of reasons, but I like to know like a deeper why, the purpose, the passion, you know, you guys run a uh, faith-based martial arts academies and you, you really do empower lives. So Cody, what is your deeper why? So there's a few reasons. I mean, you know, the, the generic term is, you know, empowering lives through the martial arts. Right. But I mean, really, when you look at that for, for me as a program director, I used to always love the times whenever you'd have this kid come in and they would be unable to look you in the eye, unable to talk loud, you know, they're hiding behind, hiding behind mom. And, and within a 30, 45 minute lesson, you're able to get that kid looking you in the eye, handshaking, high five and smiling, key eyeing, yelling, you know, just really teaching them how to project and how to come out of their shell and just being able to build those, that confidence in, in kids is a huge thing. I mean, and then for us, you know, like you said, we're a faith-based school. So, you know, we feel like we're, we're impacting the world for Christ. So, you know, we're in our program, you know, we, we accept anybody from any faith, anything, you know, we're not trying to to really, you know, I don't use the term shove anything down somebody's throat, but we do teach a uh, Christian martial arts school here. So we teach scripture, you know, we are um, looking to build the kingdom at the same time. So there's a lot of that that goes on at our school too, especially throughout our black belt test. Um, my dad has a lot of time with the black belt candidates and he's able to really talk to them and give them just teaching them how to be good people. Rather that means that they take, um, you know, Jesus and our faith, or it means they just, they just learn the, the things about, that that make you a good person that's kind of what we want we want to make awesome people in our community we want to know that if if they're a black belt or a, a high level student at algarve supreme martial arts they're making this community better um in, in ways rather it's just by being a, a leading by example in school with respect and things like that holding the door open for somebody um saying the yes ma'am and no ma'am whenever a lot of other kids nowadays aren't doing it we want our kids to be set apart and different and showing that respect so I mean, that's for me what it is. It's just literally just trying to impact our community. Whenever there's an Algarve Supreme Martial Arts School, and I'm sure it's the same for, for you guys in Abilene, you know, we want to know that whenever we come in that community, we're trying to make it better. You know, we say it's the mind, body, and spirit. And if you could truly connect those things, then you're not only creating good martial artists that physically can defend themselves and fight and they're in good shape, but they're good people. And you guys are constantly, I see that, man, your leadership stuff that you guys do. Some of the numbers, I, you know, we have a, different listeners. There'll be martial artists, non-martial artists, small schools, mega schools, but you guys will promote annually. Uh, you do like an annual black belt test. And I've heard some numbers like, what's the highest number of black belts you guys have promoted? So this year, so we do it once a year, like you said, we do it eight weeks of testing over the summer. We started in October as the kickoff and they'll train once a month until January. And then they'll train twice a month until June. And then it's every day, Monday through for, uh, Saturday um, from six to nine for seven weeks. And then we have a one week test that's all day, every day for the week. It's, it's kind of a huge undertaking we do. This year we're testing 106 candidates. Um, wow. so I'm testing, uh, my son's actually testing this year too. He's testing for his first degree black belt. I'm testing for my sixth degree. 
we've got three people going for fifth degree. We've got um, a lot of second, thirds, fourths, um, and a lot of firsts. I can't tell you off the top of my head how many first degrees, but it's probably, I would guess, around 60 to 70 first degree candidates that are going for first degree black belt. And so that's pulled from all three of our locations. We do our Dickinson, Lucy, and Parallel location. They all come together for that. Um, but so our record ever promoting, I think, before this year is 103 that have made it and actually promoted. So we started at 106 this time. So I don't know if it'll be the record or not by the end of it once it all shakes down. But um, right now, we're like I said, 106 people training for it right now. That's awesome, man. Yeah, I think I got 35. We just did our black belt signing. So we're sim similar things. Um, now you guys have some some strong commitments that you get from these these people to be in there every day, you know, three hours, right? Uh, a lot of leadership development. I mean, the thing about that, there you go with 106 new community leaders, people that have become the best version of their self, you know, that, that are out there in that community. And that, that is the power of the martial arts. So, well, man, uh, good job and congratulations. I know you guys are, are going to kill it. I'm going to I'm going to try to come down. I've, I've uh, one or two many times and just sometimes had other uh, schedules. Yeah, let's talk yeah. after this. I'd love to have you. We During that test week, we bring in a lot of guest instructors like yourself to come in and they just, instead of testing, they're more just doing a seminar. We're kind of rewarding our, our candidates for all their hard work. So they'll go through testing time and then they'll just have a, an hour seminar thrown at them from somebody like you coming in and do that. And then you can sit and watch the performance on Saturday. They put on a huge show on Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon. That's the kind of the climactic thing and they tie their belts and all that. But yeah, you were mentioning sending out, you know, good people in the community. There's a book that uh, my dad picked up a while back called The Last Arrow, and it, it talks about that. And it kind of changed our mindset, um, mainly th talking about staff, but even our students too, you know, as a martial arts school, a lot of people come through and teach for us at, at, through high school and college. They're helping out and teaching, and then they, they would go off and, uh, and, and either go to college or they'd go, you know, join the law enforcement, military, whatever, just move on. And for the longest time, you know, my dad always talks about this, but it was always hard for us. We're like, man, we invest all this into these people and then go and we got to start over. Uh, but then that book kind of changed it where it's just this, this mindset of you're taking an arrow and you're shooting it out into the two, rather it's law enforcement or you're shooting it out into military or the workforce or college or wherever you're shooting them, shooting them into an area and they're going to make an impact there. You've done all that work to build that awesome person, whether it's a staff member or a high level black belt or whatever, and you're sending them out into an area where they're going to go make an impact. So that's what it's all about for sure. Yeah, hundred percent, man. Yeah. And I've seen your students, you know, if some people hear, oh, he's promoting 106 black belts this year. Well, of course you have three schools and two of them are big, a lot of students. Um, so I've seen the students and they are of quality. You know, you're not just producing poor quality black belts. So that that's what's impressive yeah it's impressive you're getting a, a large number of black belts and leaders and you're building them from the inside out but um also when it comes down to it they're good martial artists so i've also seen that you're branching out into other things you know it, it's kind of rare but also see a big growth and i don't know as much about it uh, from the sheepdog training to other type of things you got ufc fighters and people that are involved in uh, outdoor training, realistic training, survival ta tactics, shooting, offense, defense, and you're bringing that back to your students, which is very different. Tell us a little bit about what's going on with all of that, uh, those courses that you guys have been doing. Yeah, for sure. So I think the world's changing um, in a way that sometimes is, is not a great way that we all uh, have seen in our community and everything. And so, you know, just what you need to be prepared for might be a little different now than it was 20, 30 years ago. So um, for, for me, I started getting into shooting through, through, I don't know if you've seen, we have a pretty good relationship with University of Texas Police Department. They're um, one of their high level guys, chief of staff is one of my dad's uh, master black belts. So he brings us there to train their police cadets during their cadet class. And for the last like 15 years, he would bring us there we would train them on Thursday, put them through what we call no quit drill. And then the next morning, he put us in a hotel the next morning to kind of say, thanks for coming up and doing that. They would train us on the range. So that kind of got me into firearms training and stuff along a while back, like I said, about 15 years ago, that kind of sparked that interest in me of, of firearms training, self-defense shooting, things like that. Um, and so that's been something I've been growing in for a long time. And then my dad does it with me too. And so we bring up some of our black belts that do it with us and it's always a good time. But then whenever uh, Tim Kennedy has that sheepdog that you recently saw, we just did sheepdog two, um, but we did, we found sheepdog one kind of towards the beginning of Tim Kennedy doing it. And basically it, Tim Kennedy's course is 50% of it's on the mat. He has a, a black belt in jiu-jitsu, obviously Brazilian jiu-jitsu. So his, his curriculum is 
very heavy on Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and correct on Sheepdog One, and then uh, range time. So you're learning how to weapon work, work your weapon, how to draw and shoot, how to how to do self defense style shooting. So um, we did Sheepdog One a while back. It's kind of cool. We we were super blessed because there was a guy there at Sheepdog One that I met. Um, his name was Hassan, and he just happened to be helping out with the course because. You know, he just happened to be right place, right time. And I found out he was in Houston. And so I messaged, I, I told him then, I gave him my car, I said, hey, we're, we're south of Houston. If you ever want to come by and train, let me know. You're more than welcome. Well, about, I don't know, four or five months later, he walked into our Dickinson location. And I said, you know, we talked and hit it off a little bit. And so he started coming and training with us in our morning class. We have a 5 a.m. jujitsu class. Um, we like to get up and, and get after it before the sun comes up. So he started doing that. And pretty quickly after that, you know, he's helped with more sheepdog courses and kind of learned a lot more about that. And now he's leading a weapons Wednesday at our school. So we do a lot of the same things that we do in sheepdog. We do every Wednesday here at our location. So, um, which would be like grappling, but with weapons. So there might be a gun, you're trying to get the gun away and it's a little different. You know, we've all done weapons takeaways and things like that with some of the training that I know you and I have both done, but it's a little different whenever you're really grappling for a weapon. It's, it doesn't work quite as good sometimes as you, as it does in your head. Right. So, it's definitely a mindset shift. And, and and then also if you've got people who do jujitsu a lot and you're fighting over a gun, they might see like, oh, there's the arm bar or there's the rear naked choke and they go for it. And then you're like, okay, well, you're doing that. And I've got this, you know, and, and obviously we're using plastic guns, but um, you know, we, we do these drills that really change the way you look at, at fighting over a weapon, makes you appreciate how much you don't want to get into a fight with a knife or something like that, because man, it's just, it's way more difficult than it, than it looks. So. That's been a huge blessing to have Hassan at our school. He's he's training with us, like I said, and leading those classes. And then we just did Sheepdog 2, which is basically just taking it to the next level. Um, so we did Sheepdog 2, which just takes it a little deeper on the shooting. Um, it includes a little bit more striking and stuff. This is not a, a, an ad for Sheepdog, but it's an ad for realistic uh, self-defense training, I think. You know, rather you go through Sheepdog or somebody like there's a guy named John Lovell up north. I'm um, not exactly sure where he's at, but he's the warrior poet. This is his YouTube channel. I follow that guy a lot, too. He does awesome training, very similar. Um, there's a lot of them coming up because I think there's just a growth of people interested in that kind of thing. You know, whenever you see things like active shooter situations and stuff coming from a martial artist, you realize what what would I do in that situation? How do I close the gap on this guy that's got a that's got a rifle or or a handgun or something? It was actually a conversation I had with the police officer that I was mentioning that we have a relationship with. Um, you know, he was talking about that exact thing. It was after a long time ago they had a Batman. Uh, Batman shooting the guy came into Batman and shot and uh and he was telling me and this kind of changed my mindset too you know I can deal now this is the conversation that we had is he is an officer and he did not carry concealed and he saw that footage and everything about that Batman shooting and he was like what would I have done I've done martial arts my whole life but how do I get to that guy at the bottom of the theater and take that gun away from him I can't that I would be helpless in there I wouldn't be able to do anything and so it, it it's a mindset shift of okay I need to have the proper tools on me to protect my family and the community if, if the opportunity hopefully never but if it ever was there i, I want to be prepared and that comes comes from there to also something else you said is the medical training you know having the medical training how to put on tourniquets having those things with you um that all so something dog do is not just training you how to shoot but okay now let's let's say that you're in a situation and you know somebody else has taken care of the shooter but now you got people that have been shot right or you got people you pull up on a car accident and somebody's bleeding and you need to help them so having the medical training to be able to to help in that scenario also was just a different take on something that we've always done as far as martial artists um, and, you know, wanting to be able to protect ourselves and protect our family and be sheepdog, but just taking it to the level with having tools to you, whether it's to, to stop the threat or to help those around you if uh, bad things have happened. So, bro, that's good because it's like, you know, our martial arts is kind of like insurance. You have it in case you need it, but you don't really want to use it. Now, we want to use our martial arts in a lot of different ways, but we're not just trying to run around and kick people in the head. But then when you look at your martial arts, your self-defense, your fighting, so many different levels, what will work in sport may not work in street. What will work on street may not work in sport. And then hand-to-hand, -hand, now we have weapon. You have gun, you have knife, or like you said, you have gun and you know mass shooting open situations with so much distance apart. What are you going to do? So you guys are, are learning a new mindset. That's a cool thing, right? The martial arts world is its own community. And now you guys are even branching out, uh, bringing stuff back, and uh, cross-training. Yeah, people, used, people never cross-trained. 
And, you know, MMA changed the world, of course. And now we see, the, we, we see man, why, why did we not cross-train? Why was it segregated where Taekwondo stayed there, or Kimpo stayed there, or Kung Fu stayed there, and light bulbs came on, and, you know, uh, things happened where now we're doing that. You guys are, are, are really big in jujitsu. I've been there and trained with you guys. Have a good group. So that's another thing you've really branched out from because y'all didn't have a BJJ program decades ago, right? No, sir. So, so I actually fought. So, I, you know, my competition career, you know, I haven't competed nearly as much as like you and my dad. Obviously, you guys are, are, are legends compared to what I've done. But in my very first MMA fight, I fought a guy who was a just big old swole guy. He's a prison guard and he just put me on the ground. I mean, my stand up was was superior to his. I, I, you know, I tagged him up a couple of times. He decided he didn't want to stand up. And so he just bum rushed me and put me on the ground. And I couldn't get the guy off me. I realized real quick after the end of that match, I lost a split decision uh, loss. You know, I looked great afterwards. I, he was all messed up because my striking was so much better, but I just couldn't get the guy off of me. And when I got up, he put me back down. And uh, so that was kind of the eye opener for me that, okay, I'm, I, I'm not going to say anything bad about point fighting or stand up because that's very important. But if you're not well rounded, it's real easy to expose whatever you don't have. And so um, that was a big eye opener for me. And so I started training Jiu Jitsu at that point. That was. Man, uh, I mean, I started a little before that, but we really started getting serious about it, I don't know, 11 years ago. And so now we have a, a pretty killer program I'm very proud of. I mean, we have, uh, like I said, we do a 5 a.m. class. It's funny, this culture of jiu-jitsu, man, these guys want to train every day. So we started with a Tuesday, Thursday jiu-jitsu class at 5 a.m. And now there's basically Monday through Friday, there's people here training at 5 a.m. And then we have a noon class on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then we have an evening class that does more MMA style. So they do some jujitsu, but they also have stand up nights and stuff, but it's all kind of part of the same group and program. And yeah, we got some killers, man. They've got these, this newer batch that is coming out now, these blue belts and um, even some of our high white belts are just so good because there's just so much knowledge out there now with jujitsu and just people that, that put out uh, instructionals and YouTube videos and stuff. And some of these guys that joined, I mean, we've got this guy, he's a, he's like a double doctorate. He's super smart and he just studies. And so he was like two weeks in and he did like a go-go plata on our heavyweight uh -huh. MMA fighter. And everybody was like, well, what is that guy doing? And so, I mean, these guys are just getting so, so good, so fast. And it's just bringing up the whole level of the program. It's awesome. I'm loving it. Well, it's because they're training a lot and the repetition because jujitsu is very complex, in my opinion, compared to striking you know, and, and I like both, but uh, it's very complex, but they're putting the, the time and the effort. What what are the challenges that you see? Maybe you can tell me about striking, you know, kickboxing, and then jujitsu, and, and, and what are the challenges? Are your jujitsu guys also striking, or they just love jujitsu? Because sometimes it's hard for them to cross. It is. I mean, you know, it's, uh, you know, the, you were mentioning how people in the old days, you know, they, they did their own style. Right. So it's like, I feel like a lot of people still have that, like, this is, this is mine and it's the best, you know, and a lot of jujitsu guys feel that way. They feel like that's, that's the best, the style. And, um, I, I'm not going to say it's not one of the best, but I think again, being well-rounded is super important. So long answer to your question, but basically most of our jujitsu guys just do jujitsu. We have stand up class on Thursday nights and it's, four or five guys usually that come in to do stand up. One of them's our MMA fighter. And then we're trying to get, he's a heavyweight MMA fighter. So it's always tough to get people to come in here and, and fight with him because he's a big old boy. Uh, but, but that's, like I said, four or five people. And then we'll have 20 people in jujitsu, you know I mean? So uh, there's, there's a big difference in that, but we did have, uh, you were mentioning the complexities. We brought in uh, Gunsuck just a month ago or so. He came in last month at a seminar and we invited all the jujitsu guys and, actually the guy that i was talking about who's super smart and did the gogo -Go plata he came and he's done very little to no striking in his life and it just opened up his eyes to the complexity of stand-up because you know you've done stand-up your whole life so jiu-jitsu seems really complex to him he's been doing jiu-jitsu for about almost two years now stand-up was just foreign and complex to him and he always likes a good challenge so he started coming to the thursday night class because of that so i mean i th i think the more we can expose them to it and, and make them realize like i realized that i had a hole there um, you know, if they want to be well-rounded, if they have that goal, then we can try, we're trying to bring them in there. It, that that stand-up class is growing. I mean, it, it might've been four before and we're trying to get it up to six or seven, but I think over the, over time, the more we can get these guys to come into striking seminars or whatever and realize they're missing a, a piece of the puzzle that, that they'll come, you know? 
But also, people yeah. don't like getting punched in the face. People don't like getting punched right, in the face. Right. And jiu-jitsu doesn't happen. Jiu-jitsu, you tap and reset and slap, bump, and go again. Getting hits a little different. That's an acquired taste, as you know. Yeah, I know some amazing jiu-jitsu guys. Um, but, yeah, even in rolling, if you accidentally hit them, they're like the world's over. They got hit in the face. Whereas strikers or MMA fighters that do jiu-jitsu, they might accidentally get hit. And there's really no big deal, you know. But, but, but it is different. You know, I think people have to a lot of times because of how their mind is, you know, my style is the best, have to kind of get respect from that other one. It sounds like that's, you know, no gun sock, arguably one of the best ever in the world, right, to come down and show some striking, some Muay Thai. Yeah, he's going to get people's respect, you know. So maybe uh, had to experience firsthand the beauty of that different art and the practicality and how that they could learn and benefit from it. You know, I, I don't know. I like the variety. You know, it's like, would you rather be good at all aspects or great at one? I mean, both have have its purpose, I guess. Yeah. So what else you guys have, have going on at your schools? Um, yeah, I mean, you are, you are always doing something. Yeah, we stay busy, man. So we have our, our regular martial arts program. You know, it's a pr- premier martial arts program. So that's going to be like our karate, kickboxing, Krav Maga, similar to what you guys got going on. And, um, and that's kind of where we're producing those black belts I'm talking about. So that's our, that's our bread and butter. That's what we focus on a lot. Um, but like I said, that jujitsu program has been growing. We've got a program that, that is, uh, has been really successful. It's kind of gone like this with COVID. It kind of lost some steam and it's picking back up now. Um, but that's just our, so, so for us, at least we have our premier martial arts program and adults can do that also, or we also have just like a straight Krav Maga program that they do um, because we still do a lot of the karate and stuff that I'm not sure if you guys do that or not, but we still do katas and stuff like that. So in our premiere, so the Krav program is just strictly the Krav Maga self-defense. And then we have the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And then we also have uh, some guys that here that have some longtime students, my parent or my dad that uh, does modern Arnis. And so he teaches a modern Arnis program here that, that is an option for our students. And then we have cross kick, which is like our fitness kickboxing program. So Lots of stuff going on week in, week out. You know, we got a lot of space. We have three mats, um, four mats at one location, three mats at another location. So those are doing all that. Our Paraland location, the 1,400 square foot, is just running the Premier Martial Arts program. That's all that they have space for. Um, but we got a lot going on at our League City in Dickinson. And then we do, you know, I'm not sure if you guys do sparring season. Do y'all do, do, y'all do a sparring season? We, we do at times, yeah. We're coming up on sparring season starting tomorrow and that for us is a, a massive undertaking event we do not sure how you run it but we run it for four weeks um we do a kickoff and then four weeks of fighting and it's uh, on friday nights and we have 200 people 215 people that do it uh, broken up into eight teams and it's become such a huge family event we, we bring out food trucks and ice cream trucks and i mean it's a, a huge like six to eight thirty or nine o'clock event where everybody's cheering each other on and then afterwards eating and hanging out and having ice cream. It's, it's a ton of fun. So we stay busy, man. You know, like I was saying earlier, I feel that we have a good culture, good family, but when I go to you guys academies, it is, it is a different level. You guys get so much love and support from your students and the parents and the families, but you're only getting that because they uh, want to give back what was given to them, you know, right? So they don't mind, helping you guys going out of the way because they appreciate and value and they understand they're self-aware to know what they've been given so yeah i again just props to you guys kind of doing the right things yeah what would you say to you know because you know the business side of this really well also what would you say to martial arts schools that are nowhere near at your level you know i was a one-man show forever i remember opening my school with 20 students and growing from there but to to want to be able to teach martial arts full-time for a profession is a blessing you don't have to go and work eight to five and hustle and grind every day go take a shower and then go teach classes six to nine you know now that's okay if that's somebody's goal but what can you give us on if it's business tips pointers or just the motivation for a lot of these schools that are not at your level they're not succeeding financially as well as just that kind of growth? Well, I think having some systems in place, you know, as far as some of the stuff that we've got originally from from Premier, you know, were great for us as far as the systems and and things like that. But beyond that, I think it's 
really our big fo focus is culture. We want to build a culture that that people want to be a part of. They want it's a family culture here, um, which is a, a common theme throughout martial arts schools. I think I don't think that's earth shattering information, but the more that you can make your school the place to be and, and things like I mentioned, the sparring season or parent night outs or white belt buddy bash think anytime we bring people in for parties rather they're free parties or paid parties um picnics christmas parties uh summer picnics and pool parties when we can bring it together where it's not just an activity that they're going to and doing twice a week but they actually feel like they're really a part of a family and they feel like they're part of something um and you know that i feel like is what has given us the longevity that that, that we've had and my dad's had is just being able to build that in so obviously quality martial arts obviously um you know all that but i think the the fact that we are a christian martial arts school um is is a part of that you know just that it, it kind of brings that i don't want to say church feel but you know when you're a part of a church you feel like you're part of something too so it's a little bit of that you know we have that family feel here or we really shoot for it at least um you know i like to think that we have a pretty good culture which i i feel like is again the what i feel so honored to take the battalion of so that's that's anybody can sell you a martial arts school or something like that but i'm like i said earlier i'm just feel so honored and blessed to be able to take the torch from my dad because i know how much work he put in over the last 46 years to get to where it's at right now and it's just it's an amazing place to be it's an amazing place to work it's an amazing place to train um and that didn't come easy over over the time that it did and so um i'm just trying to keep that going that's kind of what i get to do now is you know my dad's uh the visionary still he he comes up with all these great ideas and does all this stuff with, as a visionary and then I and the owner of course and he's still running the show but then I get to be the one that kind of tries to come in here and make all the events happen I'm more hands-on than, than he is at this point he teaches his classes that he likes to teach and uh he can kind of do whatever he wants he's at a position where he's only here because he's he has a passion for it he's never going to retire and that's perfectly fine with me I don't want him to um so I get to try and keep that ball rolling like like he's been rolling it you know so it's awesome yeah, that, that's good. Yeah, you know, we have to all, we have to be top of mind. We have to have that branding. So being out in the community, all these special events, you know, from parties to picnics to, you know, uh, f f free seminars and from kids safety, women's self-defense. And then all that creates with the numbers, the strength, the bonding, uh, social belonging. Well, Cody, uh, what else would you say? I mean, any advice, tips, pointers, words of wisdom? Yeah. Kind of close with that. I mean, you got martial artists that quit martial arts every day. Kids, adults. I mean, we could talk about parents quitting martial arts for the kids. Lot, lots of things. But when we lose the people that quit on something that is so good for them, maybe they quit early because of bad experience. And this goes for kids and adults, you know. So if we wanted to inspire people to not give up, to not quit. Or right, anything else you would like to close with? No, I, mean, I think that's a good a good one as far as just being a martial artist and, and knowing that the juice is worth the squeeze. You know, I mean, there's everybody goes through uh, seasons where it's the brown belt lull or slum or whatever you call it. You know, it's that you get to that point where you're just like close, but too far away from that black belt. And then, you know, people want to quit all the time. I think every martial arts school goes through that. And I'm, I'm sure you have the same thing every now and then. And so having those conversations with the parents, sometimes exactly what you said is, Hey, you know, w a lot of times what we tell them is, uh, you know, I've never ran into a student after they've quit that says, I'm glad my mom or dad let me quit. That's all. I'm sure you get this too. You'll run into somebody at a restaurant and, you know, they used to train with you and they're like, oh, hey, hey, man, I, man, I wish I would have never quit. I'd be a black, but be a second degree by now. Or I just wish I wouldn't have quit. I could, who knows where I'd be now? And and so just trying to tell those stories to the parents and saying, hey, look, I, I promise he's going to thank you or he or she will thank you one day. Whenever they get that black belt tied around their waist and and uh, that day of graduation, they're gonna thank you for pushing them through all this. Cause, like you said earlier, we we put them through a lot that last summer. It's it's a big commitment, and uh, sometimes we have to have these conversations on the front end because they're looking at this big mountain in front of them and they're like, "What do you mean I have to be here every day? What do you mean I have to do this?" And and then I I'm like, "Look, I promise we're gonna have a conversation at the end of this, and you're gonna tell me you were right. That was that was the best summer of his life, and that was all worth it." And so that's that's a constant conversation that we have to have. And on the black belt front, obviously, because of what I just said, but even, you know, we run into it with purple belts sometimes, you know, that just have decided they want to move on and do something else. And not that we get, we keep everybody because we don't, we lose people all the time, but you know, we're always trying to make a paint a bigger picture for them than maybe they see right in front of them. 
you know, trying to, to give them that vision of having the, the black butter on their waist and what that means for their life. Yeah, you know what it's done for yourself, for others, and we just, you know, we don't want people to give up on that that opportunity of the things to come. Hey, I love the uh, the juice. The, what, what did you say? Say that again. Juice is worth the squeeze. The juice is worth. I'm still in that man. I got to write that down. Uh, you know, it takes the good and the bad, and to to us, it's not necessarily bad. It's a challenge. It's it's opportunities that we create, but. Uh, well, Cody, man, it was a pleasure talking with you. Thanks for coming on. I've been wanting to get you on for a while. I know we we uh, we, we both stay busy. Uh, you guys are easy to find. Al Garza, Premier Martial Arts, Dickinson, League City, Houston area there. And, um, yeah, I, I appreciate it, man. Anything else? Hey, I appreciate it. No, I'm I'm honored to be on here, man. I know you, you've got an awesome thing going with this podcast and with your school. So, again, like I said in the beginning, it, I didn't take it lightly. Whenever you asked me, it was a big deal. The fact that we missed it a couple of times was because of my schedule and I felt I felt horrible. I was like, man, he finally asked me and I'm, I'm not able to get on. So mm-hmm. I, I really appreciate it, man. This has been an honor for me. Awesome, man. Well, we'll do it again sometime and I'll, I'll, I'll be down there sometime every year at least once to see you guys. So uh, I appreciate it. Some of the year, so we'll make it happen. Yeah, let me know. Let me know. Well, I appreciate you guys. Uh, Everyone, be sure to follow up with all these other podcasts we have, episodes 1 to 62, and uh, follow my YouTube channel, James Cox Martial Arts. Thanks. Thanks.